So today's sermon is Band of Brothers Blueprint. Band of Brothers Blueprint. And we're going to read through some scripture right now as we continue. This is the second of three Sundays in which we're going to be looking at and have already begun to look at Luke chapter 6, verses 12 through 16, and thinking about Jesus' choice of the 12 apostles. So we'll come back to this passage next week as well, and I'll talk very more specifically for part of the sermon about Judas and God's providence in selecting Judas as one of the 12. I'm not really going to talk that much about that today. But I've combined some other scripture with Luke 6, verses 12 through 16. We'll read through all this in sequence now. Hear now God's word. Luke chapter 6, verses 12 through 16. Uh, we have another, now it came to pass, the way Luke is framing all seven of these passages, remember we're now at the seventh in this sequence of the chiasm. Now it came to pass in those days, he, this means Jesus, went out to the mountain to pray, and he spent the night in prayer with God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve whom also he named apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, and Andrew his brother, and James and John, and Philip and Bartholomew, and Matthew and Thomas, and James of Alphaeus, that is, son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas of James, that is, Judas the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Now to part of the Last Supper discourse, we looked at this last week. I'm just going to do uh, three verses today from Luke 22, verses 28 through 30. And you are those who have stayed with me in my trials. Jesus is talking to the 11 now, the apostolic inside group. Judas is out of the room at this point. Uh, and I bestow to you, as my Father bestowed to me, a kingdom, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And then also, continuing with our scripture, pardon me just a moment. Ephesians 2, verses 19 through 21. So then, Paul says, you, he's speaking to the Christians and very specifically to mainly Gentile believers in Ephesus. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the house be translated household, but it can mean temple too, house of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a temple, holy in the Lord. And then finally from the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ, to John the Apostle. My Tuesday morning group is interested in Revelation, so I've included this passage from Revelation here. Revelation chapter 21, verse 14. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers. The flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. Band of Brothers Blueprint. In Hebrews chapter 11, uh, in, in, in a magisterial summary, looking back to the Old Testament and bringing us toward the New Testament, 
Uh, Hebrews 11 begins with, now faith is being sure of things hoped for, the conviction of things not yet seen. And then the writer of Hebrews says, by it, by this faith of being sure of things that we do not yet see and moving in faith, even though we can't see the result yet. The ancients were commended for this. Then moving on, we begin with the, what's sometimes referred to as the Old Testament Hall of Fame or faith, Hall of Fame faith. Yeah. So uh, we start going through some folks and all of a sudden at verse eight, we get to Abraham. By faith, this theme of Hebrews 11, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. He didn't know where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land. It wasn't his yet. He wasn't from there. He's in the promised land, but he's living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. But they're, they're wanderers. They're tent livers. And then Hebrews chapter 11, verse 10. Here's our key verse now. For he, Abraham, was looking for or looking forward to the city that has what? If you're following in the sermon notes, you may want to be ready to fill this in. He was looking forward to the city that has foundations. And this means lasting foundations, not just, you know, a house we might build that's a little bit better than a tent. Looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. That's, that's the city, that's the, the residence you want to have, the celestial city that is everlasting, designed and constructed by God. Where is your home? To what home do you ultimately look? The Bible is inviting you and me, just like Abraham, to look ahead to a city whose architect and builder is God, a city that has true foundations that will never be shaken, the celestial city. So today's sermon title, Band of Brothers, uh, the first part of the sermon title, you probably know where that's coming from if you have kind of any snippet of uh, connection with English literature or American history. But just to remind you, you know, first of all, William Shakespeare, Henry V, uh, one of Shakespeare's great plays. In that play, Henry V, King Henry V, the young Henry, uh, leading his men into preparation for battle with the massive, much larger French army, um, on the eve of the Battle of Agincourt, on the eve also of St. Crispin's Day, Henry, King Henry, you, you remember this if you know Shakespeare at all, you know, goes into one of the greatest speeches ever written in English literature. And he says, as part of that speech, from this day on to the ending of the world, we, he's rallying his troops now, greatly outnumbered troops, we, in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. And of course, the troops are rallied. The greatly outnumbered English troops have a massive victory over the French at Agincourt. Stephen Ambrose, in turn, picks up that line from Shakespeare, band of brothers, and he used it uh, when he decided to write the story, a, it's, it's like reading a novel, but it's, it's actual history now. The story of uh, E Company, Easy Company, of the 506th Regiment of the 101st Airborne during World War II. If you've never read that book, I commend it to you. If you have any interest in American history or what happened in World War II, it's incredible. From uh, Normandy all the way through taking Hitler's eagle's nest, uh, easy Company, amazing story. And then, of course, that book was turned into one of the best TV uh, miniseries ever produced, multiple Emmy Award winning. You know, Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks produced it. 
um, Band of Brothers. So, Band of Brothers. But I'm not just talking about the 15th century in English history. I'm not just talking even about 20th century and World War II history. I'm talking about God's salvation history for you and for me. So this pertains to you and me, this Band of Brothers language. God's salvation and kingdom history. The Lord has used his own version of Band of Brothers as a what? Not just a rallying call, not just a great phrase, but as a blueprint. That's what you want to fill in that blank on. That's the sermon title. The blueprint for God to establish and build the celestial city has to do with people who are called together to be a band of brothers. That's what we're going to learn today, what the Bible is going to remind us about. Band of brothers blueprint. It's God's blueprint for the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. So, three points of reference today. I'll come back to these at the very end. They're all C's, so I've been doing the, you know, the same letters a little bit for you lately. But I've got three, three C's here. You could say four almost, but there's three points. Chosen, number one. Chosen. Kurahi. If you don't know what Kurahi means, I'll unpack that for you in a minute. Kurahi, we need that one. And then... It's all for the celestial city. Chosen, Kurahi, for the celestial city. Chosen. We talked about this last week. I talked about this last week. We are chosen through Jesus' prayer and God's providence. The apostles are chosen specifically to be apostles through Jesus' prayer and God's providence. Am I just kind of making that up because I'm Reformed Presbyterian? No, it's directly in Luke's gospel. So chosen through Jesus' prayer. Luke chapter 6, verse 12 tells us, I emphasized this last week too, that he, Jesus, spent the whole night in prayer with God. Luke actually uses a term that is not used anywhere else any other time in the New Testament. It's a hapax legomenon. Dia uh, on. I mean, it's like through the whole night. Jesus is praying. Now let's step back from this and just think about this. Are you the son of God? Am I the son of God? Who is the son of God? Jesus. Yes, he has emptied himself and become incarnate. Okay? So there's a different dynamic going on in his earthly ministry. But we know this. He is anointed by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is with him, in him, empowering him in all his ministry. So Jesus, of all people, should be able to say, hey, if I need to pray, it's only 10 minutes. I pretty much already know everything that's going on. I'll go up and pray for 10 minutes and pick out my apostles. Does Jesus do that? No. Jesus prays. Luke really is emphasizing this with this special term. Through the whole night. Now let me pause and ask you and ask me, how often y'all praying all through the night? Is God even getting an hour of communion time with you in serious prayer? Prayer is not about getting a slap answer, and it's definitely not about confirmation bias. Do y'all know what confirmation bias is? Confirmation bias is when I pretty much already have in my head the way things are with this political situation or with that situation or with this star or with that... And then for confirmation bias, all I do is go to the same social media feed or the same cable news network that tells me exactly what I already believe. And man, I can get this over with in one or two minutes. Yeah, they just told me exactly what I believe. My favorite guy who always tells me what I think just told me that again. So I'm out of this. You know you can pray in a confirmation bias mode, right? You can just say, yeah, God, this is kind of the way I think about it. Am I right? Okay, good. God just said I'm right. Hey, God told me I can do exactly what I think is right. That's not real prayer. That's twisting God in our own confirmation bias. This is not what Jesus is doing. Jesus is spending time with God. Jesus spends an entire night with God, dealing with what we talked about last week. He is under threat now. By the time we got to the sixth of the seven of these sequences of events, the Pharisees and the scribes are conspiring together to figure out how they can deal with Jesus. In other words, they want to get rid of Jesus. 
Jesus is under death threat now, in effect. That's on one side. He knows he's going to die. He knows he's come to die. And he knows that he is called by the Father to build the kingdom, not only through his own central death and resurrection, but also through gathering together and constructing a people unto God. And he needs key central leaders for this who are gonna be called apostles. So Jesus, all night, Jesus doesn't just say, yeah, I like that one. Okay, good, all right, everything good? Okay, five minutes of prayer? Yeah, I know what exactly what. All through the night, Jesus is praying. An all night communion with God. And then when morning came, he called his disciples. Let me just pause here. We know from Luke chapter combination nine and 10, we'll get to these chapters. Luke tells us Jesus in Luke chapter nine sent out the 12 apostles to preach and minister for him. But then we get to chapter 10 and Jesus is able to send out 72 other disciples who are totally competent to preach and minister for him to all Israel. So just do the numbers. You're talking about 80 plus, you know, possibly, for all I know, there's 90 or 100 plus good candidates among Jesus' larger disciple group for this 12-slot apostleship. Again, he's going to send out 72 that are totally competent. A lot of times we say, well, the apostles were sent out to preach for Jesus. Jesus sends out 72 that are not apostles. You're going to read that in Luke chapter 10. But so of this group, Jesus, by God's the Father's direction chooses 12. And he calls from among his larger group of competent disciples, 12 are apostles. And yes, there are women disciples. Remember, there are women disciples. These are all going to be men in this apostolic type role. And in all the Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and whenever you get these lists, um, before, of course, Judas is out of the picture, you're always going to get 12 let me tell you this, there are always 12. It's really important because remember, Jesus is establishing the new Israel. There are 12 tribes of Israel. Jesus is establishing the new Israel or the redeemed Israel under his kingdom ministry. There are also, of course, 12 months in the year, so Jesus is claiming his authority over all time with respect to the 12 as well. Um, but when you get the list, this is very precise. Sometimes the names or the nicknames for these apostles change in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But this, what I'm going to tell you, is always the same. There are always 12. And not only that, they're always arranged in three groups of four. Jesus is very precise with this architecture now. They're always arranged with three groups of four. That's the way they're listed. And there's, a, although, although the order of the three after the lead one may change, the lead one in each group is always the same. The first one in every single list over all the 12, the primacy position is always Simon Peter. It's always Simon Peter. And then, of course, he's the leader of the lead group of the first four, okay? James, John, Andrew, with him. The second group is led by Philip. Every single time you get this list, Philip is the leader of the second group of four. And third, James of Alphaeus, James son of Alphaeus, is the leader of the final group of four. This is not by accident. We are being told, read between the lines, there is a structure and a leadership structure. You don't just have 12 apostles. There's a, there's a substructure going on with this construction underneath the overall 12. And Judas Iscariot is always last. And by the way, when we get to heaven, we really need to commend James of Alphaeus because he had to put up with, you know, the zealot and with Judas Iscariot, would you like to be the leader of that group? Okay, apostles. Apostello, it's a verb in Greek that means to send. And a lot of times you read commentaries and a little Bible study, you know, study Bible notes that are gonna focus totally on the apostello. But I've already told you, Jesus sends other people in addition to the apostles. What Mark chapter three tells us 
is that they're chosen to be apostles first and foremost to be with Jesus all the time and then to be sent out from him. So they have a special band of brothers, do you hear me, inner relationship with Jesus. That's what they're being chosen for. And then ultimately, as we're gonna be, be able to see, they are the primary witnesses to Jesus' entire ministry all the way through his death and resurrection. Okay, so that's who the apostles are. Um, it's a term that means like the ambassador for Jesus, the, the spokesperson who has authority to speak for Jesus. In Hebrew, it's shaliach, and it's it, same kind of thing, the ambassador. So that's chosen. These 12 are chosen for the kind of role we're talking about and the kind of leadership structure that he's designed. Do your prayers get that precise? Does your instruction, you know, God can be that precise with us if we listen. Okay, now on to Kurahi. And some of you are saying, I don't know what Kurahi means. Well, you need to read Band of Brothers or watch the miniseries. Kurahi is the motto, is the motto of the 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment of the 101st Airborne. They trained at Camp Tekoa in Georgia, and they adopted the Cherokee term Kurahi. You know what that means? I'm going to fill in the blanks for you. Okay, so sermon notes. It means we stand alone together. We stand alone together. That's Cherokee, Kurahi. We stand alone together. And these airborne guys who are going to be, you know, parachuting at Normandy, they knew they needed to stand alone together when they hit the ground, right? If, they, if God provided for them to actually live through, uh, through the, the jump. We stand alone together. Now look at Luke 22, verse 28. Jesus says to his 11 apostles, you are those who have stayed with me, that's the ESV, could be translated, who have stood by me in my trials. This has been an adjustment for me that I want to share with you. In, in doing the study for these verses, I'm reminded that I know I know a lot of kind of like surface level Bible commentators and definitely a lot of preachers always denigrate the 12 and the apostles and say, these guys are with Jesus. How could they be with Jesus and make all these mistakes? Or they failed Jesus when he really needed them uh, in the final 24 hours. And yes, the scripture is very clear. Jesus prophesies, you're all gonna fall away. But let me ask you, how do you think you would have done in the crucible? And let me remind us of this. What the scripture is telling us is for more than two years, these guys are the ones who have stuck with Jesus when the religious leaders are trying to conspire against him, kill him, when crowds are at first attracted to Jesus and then falling away. These are the ones. Jesus just told us this. In other words, they fulfilled what we read in Mark. They're called to be as his inner apostles. They've stuck with Jesus all the way to the Last Supper. I know they fail for a few hours, but these are the ones other than Judas. Jesus says, look, you've stuck with me. So therefore, I'm telling you, in the age to come, you are going to sit on thrones judging the tribes of Israel. None of us are anywhere close to that level in the kingdom. I can guarantee you this. These guys are high level. They have stuck with Jesus through all his trials until the very last one that only he can go through. Okay? So then on the other side of this, let's look at this. After Judas, you know, Jesus has died. He's ascended, been raised from the dead, ascended to heaven. Judas has betrayed Jesus and he's dead. So we need a 12th apostle, right? Acts chapter 1. Let me ask you this, parents and children, do you, I hope you can name the 12 apostles. You really, need, I mean, you really need to know the 12 apostles. Well, let's figure out who the 12th one is going to be once we ask Judas off the list. So, uh, uh, so Peter gives the criteria for who this kind of person needs to be. So one of the men, notice it's going to be a man, number one, and notice this, who have accompanied us during all the time, that the Lord Jesus went out in and out among us. In other words, like Jesus said, you stuck with me through it all, in the good times and the bad. 
Not just for a month here or there. You didn't take a break and go on vacation and say, my kid's got a ball game this weekend. I'm sorry, I'm out of here. I mean, these are the guys who have stuck with him the whole time. Beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a, here's your calling, a witness. The Greek is matura, which, you know, we get our word barter from. Like, you're going to witness for me, and you might even die for witnessing for me. Witness to his resurrection. There's two guys that qualify for this. Joseph, who's also known as Barsabbas, who's also known as Justice. And we can thank the Lord that we don't have him just because, you know, we'd have to remember all those names. Or there's one with a very simple name. It means basically gift from God. Matthias. That's what you want to fill in that blank of. Matthias. Some of you didn't have that answer already. Some of your children didn't know that answer, okay? You need to know that answer. Matthias. God, it makes it very clear because they pray and they cast lots and the lot falls on Matthias and uh, like Urim and Thurim in the, in, the New, in the Old Testament, God chooses Matthias. Now remember what Jesus says, I bestow to you as my father bestowed to me a kingdom so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Who are the people who are going to judge? The people who have stood with him alone through the thick and thin. So then calling this band of brothers, what are we leading into? The celestial city. Uh, Augustine, in his classic book, City of God, talks about the city of man, the city of fallenness. It's, we're all after our own stuff. We all want it for ourselves. In the city of God, it's all for God's glory. And Augustine says this, the peace of the celestial city, that means heavenly city, the peace of the celestial city is the perfectly ordered and harmonious enjoyment of God and of one another in God. So Christ established the foundations of this city in his band of brothers. We've already been told this. Let me continue on this. In Revelation chapter 21, I'll just lead in with verse 9. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls of the seven plagues. Remember the final cycle with Revelation? One of those angels comes to John and spoke to me saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Who is the bride, the wife of the Lamb? The new Jerusalem. Okay, so we're going to see this new Jerusalem. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Okay, I'm going to fast forward in the description. The wall of the city had a certain number of foundations. Can anyone guess how many foundations? Twelve. The wall of the city had twelve foundations. Fill that in on your notes. And on them were the twelve names of the twelve who? Apostles. The twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Now let me just, I want you all to be in heaven. But I don't want you, any of you to show up ignorant. I don't want any of you to show up saying, what are all those names on those foundations? You need to know why the names are there, what God was doing with the construction, and you need to know those names. I don't want any of you showing up saying, what's that? Okay, we're good. All right. So, the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Now, Paul, in Ephesians 2, 19 through 21, as we read, he says, you are, even the Gentiles, which means us, even those of us who are saved now, we are members of God's house. God's house built on the foundation, you already know this, of the apostles and prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom all things are fitted together. And by the way, you are building blocks. You're like little bricks in this great construction of the true city and house of God. Okay? So, Ephesians 1, 3, and 4. I have good news for you. When did you get selected? Was it when you were 8 and 9 and said, I'm going to be a really good kid? And God said, you know what? That, that seemed heartfelt to me. I guess I'll let them in. Was it when I was 16? 
What was it when I had my first child and suddenly got serious about God? No, no, no. Look at this. Ephesians 1, 3 through 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. He chose us before the foundation of the world that we might be connected with the foundation of the celestial city. Do you see this? Through the band of brothers, okay? That we should be holy and blameless before him. So our call to faith reflects the central call of the apostles. Number one, you, Christian, if you're saved in Jesus Christ, you were and are chosen for the city of God forever. Number two, remember Kurahi, which means we stand alone together. The world doesn't like Christian doctrines and faith and principles anymore, in case you hadn't noticed. We are an increasing besieged minority. But you know what? What do we do? Just like the apostles, we stand alone together with Jesus, no matter what. We can't do that by our fleshly power, but by his spirit, he will empower us in that. So, chosen, Korahi, we stand alone together, and then finally, we're being fitted for the celestial city, which is forever. Isn't that good news? And when we get there, we're going to know. We'll see those names on the foundation, and we'll know. And most of all, we'll know and celebrate the name of Jesus, the one who already chose us before the foundation of the world to be with him forever. Live in that. Believe in that. And we stand alone together no matter what. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Let's pray. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.